I believe a lot in, 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 in human relationships and when you establish those relationships, everything flourish and everything blossom. And if the right people cross your path, your way, uh, ideas happen and great ideas happen. And, and, and then it just takes uh, a small initiative to, to, cre- to start a, a revolution again. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. The countries of South America have many influences and many expressions when it comes to cuisine. Peruvian food, for the most part, remains misunderstood down under, but one chef has led the way in introducing the depth and breadth and wonder of Peruvian food. Alejandro Saravia is the owner and executive chef of Farmer's Daughter in Melbourne. Alejandro, how are you? Very good, Anthony. Thank you very much for inviting me to be part of your podcast and um, yeah it's very excited to, to chat with you it's great to have you on the show you've um, had an amazing influence and career in Australia um, and really at the forefront of, of showcasing Peruvian food but that's not the only thing you've been doing but what was it like in the early days for you um, expressing Peruvian food to the food culture in Australia Look, I, I think, I mean, and, and, and we met um, just when I was starting the whole um, Peruvian revolu- revolution here in Australia, uh, in Sydney, in around 2006, 2007, when I, when I arrived. Um, look, it's, it's incredible. I'm, I'm so privileged to be able to call Australia home after 18 years or a little bit more than living here. And, and at the same time, starting in this country, promoting and showcasing, introducing my homeland cuisine. Um, as you mentioned in the intro, um, back in those days, around 2007, 2008, um, Australians knew about Peru just because of Machu Picchu or the longest left wave that we have in the north coast of Peru that a lot of surfers from Australia were chasing and, and enjoying back in the 80s or 70s. Um, but just that. And um, in, the early, in the early 2000s is when Peru starts to be recognized internationally as the gastronomical capital of, of Latin America. Uh, a lot of chefs like Gaston Acurio, Virgilio Martinez studying uh, his his uh, internships or, or his experience alongside with Gaston uh, and many other chefs ventured overseas to to um, to learn more of what was happening in the, in the um, in the gastronomical world in Europe in Asia and then they brought all that knowledge into back into Peru and start applying and discovering all these beautiful ingredients like quinoa for example uh kiwicha the the cacao beans from Peru that nowadays are very very on demand um uh, meats like alpaca meat, for example, or all the different varieties of chilies that we grow in Peru, uh, and that the, the uh, bio the diversity of the climates that we have in 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 the coast in the Andean Sierras, and then going down to the to the Amazon jungle, and and all that started to create this um, gastronomical revolution in Peru, which I'm so privileged to, to be part in some way. Once I started working in Europe, recognizing the value of it. But then when I started, when I arrived here in Australia, which I have to be honest, my whole intention to come into Australia was to have a little bit of a break uh, yeah. of the restaurant. The, uh, the restaurant that I, I, I finished my stint in uh, in uh, Fat Duck with Heston Blumenthal, and uh, before that I was the, at the Ambassadors in uh, in Paris in the Three Michelin Star Restaurant. So I was a little bit tired. Um, I, I was very young. Um, I needed to refocus, re re reimagine my career, re- revalue uh, my goals as well. And I came into Australia because I had a few friends uh, living in Sydney and, and they were telling me how amazing the gastronomy 
my uh, uh, industry or hospitality industry was growing and um, and blooming in around 2006 2007 and and I thought well I'll give it a go I've never thought to come to Australia at that point I thought I will spend a year travel around I'll probably enjoy a little bit of the surf here as well and then make my way back to Europe through Southeast Asia <laughs> and um, and obviously, um, I fell in love with this country, with the uh, opportunities that this country provides to everybody that wants to do something different and be part of it. Um, and in at the end of 2007, that's when I started um, thinking, why nobody is doing anything about South American or Peruvian cuisine in this case? Uh, there were a few very um, under the radar, very basic initiatives at that, around that, that point. But everybody was focusing on Asian cuisine, in European cuisine, Frank Amora was opening Movida in Melbourne. And, mm -hmm. and to be honest, he was my, my inspiration on, on okay, I can, uh, if he can do that with Spanish cuisine, and a little bit arrogant, uh, at that point, being young as well, if not knowing his his uh, his his expertise and experience, I was like, ah, if this chef can do that with Spanish cuisine, I can definitely do that with Peruvian cuisine. And I traveled to Melbourne, um, went to have dinner at Movida uh, next door, and uh, and that's when I started thinking, well, I need to do something, and this is my opportunity to to do something. Um, big in the industry that I love. So since then, I started. I studied marketing and business in Peru after I studied my culinary uh, degree in Le Cordon Bleu in Lima. So what I what I did was basically seeing Peruvian cuisine as a product, and how do I introduce a product in an in, a, in an existing market, a new product into an existing market. Before we explore what you've created here, take us back to Peru um, when you were young and, and some of the food and feasts that you had with your family. Look, I come from um, a very diverse family. Half of my family is Italian, the other half is uh, Spanish. Uh, we do have, um, obviously, we all grew up and, and born in Peru, so we also have that pride of being Peruvians as well. And um, we, as Peru is, is a multicultural melting pot of different influences. Um, nobody in my family cooks, I have to say, except, except for my grandmother. And I have to be very, very grateful that I spend quite a bit of time with my grandmother growing up in Peru, going to the markets, um, learning from the farmers, the, the producers, the market vendors in the markets in Peru, talking to them. And, and I, I think th those are my first memories of, of um, hospitality or, or, or the food or, or, or being in, involved in food because as 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 it is here in Melbourne with markets and also in Sydney in in the in the fruit and veg market in Sydney, you establish that relationship with the market vendor with the farmers and and if you go regularly, that relationship becomes a friendship and it's not just an uh, a financial transaction of I give you money, you give me product. They actually start saving you the best they find you um new products as well new ingredients um they save you the best as well and you start learning from uh from them which are the experts on on their field and and that interaction that relationship caught my attention in a very early age on how how uh, amazing is to actually know somebody that had dedicates their life and the, in, in some cases generations just on growing potatoes, for example. So you need to be super passionate to do that, and that was for me very admirable. What what led to a career uh, in the hospitality industry for you? So what I well while I was growing up. Um, there was always the ceremony of a Sunday long lunch in my family, in my grandmother's house. And every time that happened, I was 
I was there very early helping in the kitchen. I started, I remember I started in a very, very early age peeling peas, you know, taking the peas out of the shell. Um, and then you progress into a more intricate um, task in the kitchen. And, um, and everybody had a, a, a task from my father, my, my mother, everybody involved in the family that was involved in that lunch had a task to set up the table, um, to prepare the cocktails, to make sure that the wine is open. Uh, and then there were cooks in the kitchen when my, my, my grandmother was going around cooking with them, tasting. And, and that, that um, organized chaos in the kitchen was always very appealing for me. Um, after that, uh, obviously, growing up in Peru, we are exposed to a lot of different flavors, a lot of different um, influences from Japanese influence, Chinese, Italian, Spanish, uh, going to the native cuisine in the Andean Sierras and in the coast as well. And I was always very interested on how food get people together around the table and my family was is very much like that. Like we are passionate about a long lunch, you know, a long lunch that starts at eleven thirty and then finish at eight at night. Um, but people, friends come come in, joins the the table, stay for a while, they have a drink, a little bit of eat to eat, and then conversations flow. We have we're very fortunate that we know people from different backgrounds. And for me, that was hospitality, and I really really enjoyed that. Then I met different chefs in Peru that um, that started uh, teaching me or in some way uh, exposing me to what uh, uh, um, to the understanding of the ingredients that they were working and and knowing that and, and and that understanding that education caught my attention a lot so. When I was 16, 15, 16, I, I um, make um, a deal with my father. At the same time I was finishing high school, I was enrolled in uh, Le Cordon Bleu in, in, in Lima. And, uh, and that's when I started um, formally being educated as a chef uh, in Peru. And then I took a year off and then went back to Peru and study uh, uh, a career in university, which was marketing and business, as part of the as part of the deal, because my father was, well, to be a chef, that's going to be your hobby, and and um, then you have to study a proper career. <laughs> it it led to, as you mentioned earlier, like time at the Fat Duck and ambassadors as well. What was it like in those kitchens compared to what you had experienced back home in Peru? Those kitchens gave me the opportunity to understand the modern side of uh, the, a more structural way of working in the kitchen. Um, I mean, in Peru, um, because the labor is a little bit less expensive than than in other countries in the world, um, you get to have a, a bigger brigade in the kitchen. Things have changed, obviously, now, which is positive for the industry um, but at the same time most of the the cooks or the chefs in in the in that time in Peru um, like late 90s uh, they were not officially trained not formally trained they they, they had knowledge because their knowledge was passed on from uh, a mother or a father that was a cook and started cooking in a restaurant as part of a, a trade uh, but it was not formalized. It was not um, um, established with parameters or techniques or, or uh, a, a strong, um, yeah, technical background. Um, going to to Europe and working in those restaurants obviously opened up uh, my my interpretation and my understanding of what a chef what a chef was and what what actually can achieve in the industry it's not just some in my opinion it's not somebody that is just cooking amazing food and works with beautiful flavors it's it's the leader of a of a of a, a whole area in the restaurant it's a it's a mentor it's a business person it's um it's a public person as well because um 
you need to it's a salesman you need to sell sell your 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 food to the customers you need to explain it proper you need to know how to communicate that properly so so it's appealing to a customer you know so 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 uh, the customers are more inclined to consume your product and and that's what i saw in europe and obviously uh, i'm making sure that um like reaffirming or reassuring that techniques are very important you know going i remember i went i went there and i was working with a lot of molecular cuisine and one of the i was very lucky that working in those kitchens they never exposed the young chefs to directly to molecular cuisine from the get-go it was more you need to you need to have your basics your basic skills your basic te techniques down packed and when they see they saw that you um that you were um, you were on top of those techniques. That's when they slowly started to introduce in the new ones, the modern ones. So your training didn't, um, so you don't, you didn't um, uh, skip a step, you know, which is important. Back in 2006, 2007, when we met, you had a restaurant in Surrey Hills delving into the uh, food of uh, Peru. Take us back to that time. Do you have any stories of the challenges and, and successes of, of that period of time introducing Peruvian cuisine? Yes, many. <laughs> many, many. <laughs> uh, look, I always look at the, those times. Uh, Morena was, I arrived in, in Australia in 2006, so Morena was open in around 2010. Uh, I took the time to work in different restaurants in Sydney to to understand and to to be able to learn from the local culture the local ingredients because um, even though peru and australia shares the pacific and we share a lot of the the ingredients that we grow here and, and over there in peru um, I needed to to learn more and understand more, and I again was lucky enough to to choose the right restaurants to work around that time uh, with amazing chefs like Grand Keen, for example. I worked with uh, uh, Guillaume in Benalong, um, and and uh, Nathan Darling in sales at Lavender Bay. So they were always very open to 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 train but also to have a good discussion about you know ingredients even though they were busy chefs and they were like um uh always on the pump and and running around running good operations um the brigades were very well sought sought through and selected and and there was an amazing group of people working in those restaurants in those days and and that helped me a lot to um, to understand the ingredients here in, in, in Australia. Like I remember Grant was experimenting with molecular cuisine in Pierre back in those days. And even though I had the experience, he always said the same. It's like, you focus on learning about Australian ingredients and, and what we're doing, let us learn about this molecular um, approach. And he was in a corner trialing different things. There was uh, some succeeding, some failing, but learning from the failures as well. So that 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 approach was really good for him. Would have been really easy to say like, okay, you work with this, tell me what's the secret, you know? Uh, but when I started Morena, I mean, I was very young as well, and it was my first restaurant. Um, uh, I probably still had at that point that um, that approach that the chef needed to be all the time in the restaurant, absolutely every single minute and an hour in in the kitchen or in the dining room, and um, and it was a, it was a great op opportunity for me to uh, lead my own team, do my own cuisine. Uh, make my own mistakes and 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 also celebrate my my, my well the the group's um, uh, achievements. I learned how to uh, how difficult is the the, um, the restaurant industry uh, in general, uh, not only on the small margins that we need to that we need to maximize, but also um, 
working with different areas of, as I was saying before, marketing, promoting your your restaurant, promoting your brand, hosting your customers, dealing with uh, staff, and um, and it's not it's not just a dream of I'm gonna I just want to cook beautiful food for my guests, right? Um, being a new cuisine as well, it was challenging in the way of. Um, Again, Peruvian cuisine was very undermined in the in the mentality of of the Australian market in general because nobody ha, nobody had had done anything different uh, or at the at the level that I was doing at that point with Peruvian cuisine. Everything was uh, a whole in it was um, a very casual dining experience before of a home cook that venture into a takeaway shop something like that but nothing really well thought or trained or uh, developed and um and changing the mentality and changing the perception of the of the market was um was very um very it took it took a little bit of time it took a little bit of time um again i was lucky enough to meet people that support the concept uh, that understood the concept or at least was trying to uh help to um, to bring a new new flavors into into the industry, like uh, that's when I started. I, I met you, and we did an, an article, and we, I remember. I, I remember. I, I clearly remember that day when I cooked that green uh, tamal, uh, coriander tamal, and the uh, confit duck, uh, Maryland on top with the salsa criolla, and see those combinations of flavors of textures were never presented in a restaurant before uh, in Australia and in, in Sydney. Um, people like Joanna Saville, for example, at that time, um, the director of, of uh, Sydney Good Food Month, I think she was, uh, she was always um, happy to, to have us as a part of the festivals and, and being able to do a master class in front of uh, a, a, an open public stage in, 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 cent, in cent in the Central Park in, in in Sydney and all those opportunities I was wise enough to grab them and make the most out of it uh, and that is why um, I have to say that all that work was a, a, a process and it was a planned process I did have a plan on how to do this and um, and it worked out it worked out now that um, now I'm so proud to see there are Peruvian restaurants popping up in Brisbane Peruvian restaurants uh, in Sydney uh, obviously here in Melbourne there is a few as well and uh, and I'm glad to say that um, in some way I I, pa I, I paid the um, the, the way for all these initiatives to come in and, and I, I can't wait to see more initiatives to come, more uh, more chefs to come and I'm pretty sure that a lot of them will do amazing things in the future for Peruvian and Latin American cuisine. You made a move to Melbourne where you've had incredible success there. Um, tell us about that period of time. What, what was the turning point for you and the success that you've had in Melbourne? Look, um, I moved to Melbourne because um, where we established Morena, the lease was uh, expiring. It was only a small, uh, a two-year lease because the place was going to get redeveloped. Uh, at the end of the lease, um, the the place never got developed, and we thought the restaurant was doing well. We thought, well, let's venture to a different area, a different a different side. We needed a bigger side, and we couldn't find anything uh, in Sydney uh, at the at the price point that we that we needed. Also, the the industry in around 2013, 2014 was going to a little bit of a difficult time um, in in that time in in Sydney, and and I met uh, a group of people here in Melbourne that they were doing really good things in uh, in in the Argentinian style or themed restaurants, and and uh, that's when I got approached and said like we want to open a Peruvian restaurant and we have been to Morena. Uh, we got introduced by a mutual friend that he, he imports um, wines from Argentina. And, um, and then we, we got, we got along. We were on the same page when we opened Pastuso here in Melbourne. Uh, Pastuso, I have to say that has, was the pinnacle of, not the pinnacle, probably the, the restaurant that has 
solidified my presence in the in the hospitality industry as a Peruvian chef, as a chef as well. Um, obviously, look the location that we that we have that the Pastuso is in uh, down on ACDC Lane. That was um, that was a, a p part of the of the uh, of the deal and 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 having number one, I think it was ACDC Lane or, or being located in ACDC Lane in Melbourne. I was like, can it be better than that? <laughs> um, and, that and that's when I decided. Well. I, I came in to Melbourne a few times, uh, met a few chefs, um, dined in a few restaurants, and I saw that the industry was um, was in better in better shape here at that point than what it was in Sydney uh, around that time, that time 2000, 2013, um, 2014. Um, so I decided, well, maybe it's a good it's a good um op opportunity to to branch into melbourne and that's when i moved here to melbourne i, w I was working i uh, been uh, part of pastuso until last year and uh, and again i i i i save with me a lot of i keep with me a lot of really really good uh moments i'm always going to be grateful for that restaurant for what it made me and helped me achieving in the Peruvian side uh, and the Latin American concepts uh, here in the industry. And also the community here in Melbourne, um, I'm not comparing obviously Sydney or Melbourne in, in any way because it's completely different. Uh, but when I came in here, I felt really, really at home. I feel that I felt that um, um, the community was embracing and was interesting, interested in what I was doing from the get go. Um, maybe it's because I, I had already a little bit of a profile uh, around that time. But um, yeah, like meeting chefs, I finally met Franca Mora in a festival, and, and for me that was like amazing. Uh, and, uh, and Frank was the first ones to basically give me his number and said, hey, if you need any advice on suppliers or, or anything, please, you know, reach out. The same as Andrew McConnell um, and, and, and Shane Delia back in those days as well. And, 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 I, and I keep those relationships uh, alive here. And, and, and for me that was, that was amazing because those were chefs that uh that i always saw from from the far and and that i admired for what they were doing what they were bringing to the to the industry and the restaurants that they were building these days you have farmers daughters tell me a little bit about uh the the concept and and, and what you're doing there so farmers daughters um is a concept that started five years ago and um it, it was never meant to be a restaurant to start with. It's uh, it was it was it was part of my own curiosity and inquisitive, being inquisitive and and part of my own self development as well as uh, as a chef to understand where where ingredients coming from where where um where i was where 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 I was located as well I'm trying to look for that sense of place. A uh, sense of identity. Um, at that time, um, my first son was going, was born, Lucas, and for me that was very. It was it was um, a big issue that I needed to learn more about where I what I uh, the place that I consider home, you know. Um, and that ventured me to start traveling more into the regions, talking more with farmers, producers, and the region that I started um, researching or or, or uh, exploring uh, was Gippsland. Um, and that's when I started learning more. And obviously, as you know, Gippsland is super super big. <laughs> it's it's uh, it's the biggest uh, region in in Victoria. It's uh, Probably I will be I will be um, venturous to say that it's one of the richest regions in Australia, in terms of diversity uh, of products that you can find, microclimates as well, and and um, and I started exploring. I started meeting people, and again, um, I think I believe a lot in 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 human relationships, and when you establish those relationships. Um, 
everything flourish and everything blossom. And if the right people cross your your way, uh, ideas happen and great ideas happen. And 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 then it just takes uh, a small initiative to to create to start a, a revolution again. And and that's what I I. I started in Gibson. I never, uh, when I started discovering and, and understanding all the ingredients that are coming from that region and the beautiful people and culture that, that, that Gibson has, I, I, I never understood why nobody was doing anything to promote this region like they do in, in Europe, you know? Uh, and so I took the challenge um, uh, and I started sourcing most most of my products from Gippsland. I started talking with a lot of producers, a lot of farmers in Gippsland. And also um, I created the Renaissance Gippsland lunch that um, was a lunch that it was basically set up in a farm in Gippsland for 200 people. And I was gonna cook with a group of chefs, a friends of mine, um, but in a campfire setup um, with ingredients only sourced from that part of the region. Uh, I presented that idea to Melbourne Food and Wine Festival. I think the first one was in 2017. Um, yes, 2017. And, uh, oh, sorry, to, yeah, 2017, 2016, around that time. And um, Melbourne Food and Wine Festival um, was very kind to embrace the concept and and say yeah we'll put it in the, we'll put it in the in the schedule but just to let you know at that time they were like most of the regional events at this scale they never succeed because you know you're asking for two pe 200 people to come i mean your ticket prices is not is not, they're not cheap um i know that it's going to be value for money but just be careful and Think about it. And my personality is as soon as somebody tells me that, I'm, just, I'm determined to make it. So <laughs> we put all our resources on it. I started promoting um, the event and we sold out. We sold out uh, two weeks before the event, which was amazing. And now we had 200 people coming to a beef farm to dine with us in the middle of the paddock. <laughs> So we move a lot of contacts, we move a lot of logistics, and we made it happen. And the first one was amazing, you know, like it was imagine five buses or more coming in through the farm, parking in, in on the side of the paddock, a nice marquee in the middle of it, fire happening on the side. Uh, and then suddenly we uh, and we got beautiful wine from south gippsland and, and i have to say uh philip jones was an amazing support from bass philip and that in those days and philip was pouring one uh, crown prince wine uh, pinot noir um in in the glasses like free pouring and he being around and beef uh, paul crop the beef farmer was there as well um a lot of a lot of people like david jones for a garlic farmer from mirbo north um we had a, we had a lot of personalities a lot of great people that were passionate about the region passionate about the ingredients and what they were doing so i thought this is exactly what I want to do. This is the next step in my career is what I, I want to be, I want to be discovering this more and more and, and get that sense of place, get that sense of identity that I thought that I think still it's important for me to pass on to, to my, my kids, my sons, uh, Lucas and now Gonzalo, which is four and three. And, and I think that's important. So that's how a farmer's daughters started. And then, uh, after two, three uh, Renaissance lunches, um, I got approached by Tennis Australia. Being a, a tennis fan, um, uh, I, I said, yes, whatever you want to do, what I do. <laughs> uh, and that relationship has been a, a long and beautiful relationship with the people of Tennis Australia as well. And I was part of the chef, chef series where I got to bring that concept of promoting a regional a region like Gippsland in Gippsland into Melbourne. So we did uh, four dinners with Gippsland produce, farm to table, 
real farm to table, you know, like we have farmers coming from Gippsland dropping up the ingredients so we can prep it in, 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 uh, in where the Australian Open happens. And um, a lot of the farmers came in for the dinner as well. And, and one of the things that I like, as you probably noticed by now, I like to talk. <laughs> <laughs> so, so for me it was, I need to go out into the dining room and tell those stories of the farmers, tell my story as well of traveling through Gippsland um, uh, and then and, and to eat directly to the customers. And that's that's how the experience was. It was, yes, we were cooking in the back. The, my team was uh, fine uh, serving and I was on front serving. I was on front telling stories. I was on front talking with the customers, tapping every single table in um in, in in a certain point of the the journey or a certain point of the dining experience and uh and telling those stories telling my story telling the farmers the story and i think that that is when i saw there is a concept here there is a restaurant here there is actually a purpose here uh, that we can develop so we can bring Gippsland to Melbourne because for those ones that they don't know how far Gippsland is, just to get into Gippsland, you have to drive an hour and a half. That's the, the limit between Gippsland and Melbourne. And, um, and then if you want to go two hours drive, it's just when you started seeing these beautiful uh, scenery of ro green rolling hills or Wilson's Promise, or it's almost uh, two hours and a half drive. And for, for Victorians back in those days, before COVID, uh, that was a long drive. So they weren't exploring. Now after COVID, people are venturing more and more into the region, which is amazing and it's beautiful to see. How much have have these connections um, that you fostered and this understanding of the region, how much has that changed your cooking and what you're doing at Farmer's Daughters? I have to say that my cuisine, and it is, is, I was having a chat with a chef friend of mine uh, the other day about this because at the beginning it was very intricate, very uh, like every young chef, I wanted to put all the all my, my tricks on one plate and um, and then slowly you realize that you can't do that. Now my cuisine is more respectful to the ingredients that we work with. I I like to say that and I'm I am proud actually to say that the menu is dictated by the farmers rather than the chef. So we work with what the farmers give us. We work with the knowledge that we acquired from the relationship that we have with the farmers, the understanding of the ingredients that we have with the farmers. And then it's our expertise as chefs on how to treat these ingredients with different techniques, what, uh, what we're utilizing, what we are working with. But I'm trying to and unconsciously, I'm using, I'm transforming less and less the ingredients that I work with, because I work with the best ingredients on season, directly from the farms. So for me, it's like, this is the best carrot that you're gonna eat. Why? Why should I? Um, boil it, blend it, uh, and then set it again with, uh, with uh, agar agar, for example, and make a paper out of it. No, <laughs> you, you, you know what I mean? It's beautiful, that, that kind of cuisine has its time, has its place, has its, um, uh, its part in, in, in the gastronomical history. But I think now we need to, we are more mindful and more grateful of going back to the basics, having the opportunity of going back to the basics and appreciating things for what they are, not for the, what they need, uh, what we think they need to be. This change and journey that you've been on, uh, what impact has it had on you? Has it, has it changed you, this different focus in regards to food? Yes, 100%. I mean, it's, it's not only changing me in the way I see food or I, I, I see my, my career as a chef uh, and, and restaurateur. It's also changed the way I interact with people. I, I, um, I'm trying to give them more time. I, I try to 
value more the time that I spend with people that I admire, that I value, that I that I uh, care, and I'm try I try to show them that I care by giving them the the time. And, and it's the same with the ingredients. It's the same with the menus. It's not a rush anymore. It's not. I'm I'm taking the time to to do what I love and enjoy what and, and enjoy the the process and not just chase the the next big thing well alejandro i know that there's so much more that we can talk about so perhaps we'll have to catch up again in the not too distant future and have another big chat um please keep in touch uh, and we'll catch up again soon thank you very much anthony again and, and again as i said in when when you sent me the invite uh, it's a privilege and an honor to be part of your podcast i follow it from the beginning and 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 it's great thank you very much this is the deep in the weeds podcast i'm anthony huckstep Stay tuned as we take a deep dive into the lives of the incredible people who ply their trade in the food and hospitality sector. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.